Greetings, everyone. Mark Daniel Nelson here today with a special Marvelously Well episode, and we are showing off this brand new book, Home Studio Recordings, The Complete Guide by Warren Hewitt and Jerry Hammack. These two bozos decided to team up <laughs> and do this great breakdown of pretty much everything Warren has learned over the last 25 years. How long have you been doing this? Maybe a little bit longer, but I'll date myself. I started when I was 16, so you could do the math. Going through this, trying to say, okay, as a newbie, this would be probably one of the best books to kind of dig into. I feel like, obviously, we have videos and stuff like that to learn, but to be able to have like your little handbook or your counterpart to be able to go through and have with you while you're learning is probably even better than video making. This is exactly how I learned it after That's how I learned. school. That's why we did it. And I still use the same books. So before we go into this, I wanted to do a little bit of a breakdown interview on behalf of Warren Hewitt and find out why and how he got into the music business. So Warren, thank you for having me. And <laughs> let's dive right in and just figure out how did you get into the music industry? What was the first thing that you learned? Was it guitar? It was guitar. Um, and it's just because I wanted to be Brian May. Simple as that. It's, you know, we could conclude the interview now. I feel like um, I was a little kid and for Christmas, my dad bought me A Night at the Opera. And uh, he gave it to me and said, this is worthy. Like very old school English, that was my father. A man of very few words. And all I'd heard at that point was classical music and some jazz. It was you just classical music and jazz. what guitar was your first guitar? He built it. Your dad did? Yeah. So just like Brian May's dad. Yeah, it was his. specifically because of Brian May. And also, I, my mum um, will hate me for saying this, also because we were dirt poor. Did you, do you still have the guitar? Oh, it, it, it is at uh, an old friend of mine's house who I don't have currently have contact with. But you so. know it's probably okay. I'm, well, I, it was always my, it was my main guitar and then it became my second guitar as I started, you know, doing what we all do as guitar players and collecting guitars. The second guitar I ever got, like the first real guitar, I don't mean that to take anything away from the guitar that my father built, with a little bit of help from me, it'd be really stretching if to say that we did it together. I sanded some things, you know. Yeah. Um, was a Telecaster because I wanted to be Andy Summers. After realizing that, you know, Brian May was kind of unobtainable. <laughs> uh, Andy Summers, also unobtainable, comes to mind. So I bought, uh, a used Telecaster, it was an early 70s, I think it was a 72 Telecaster, that somebody had already put a Gibson humbucker, remember the one with the logo, the Gibson right, logo, right. in the neck position. And so I learned police songs and, you know, wanted to be Andy Summers. But going into as a guitar player at 16, 17, kind of became like a band leader as well, which going on tours and stuff, that took you into, yeah, well, how did I, you get into that? Well, the recording thing was uh, dad's old uh, Sony Hi-Fi from the 70s and his um, Philips, you know, late 60s cassette recorder. You remember the one that was black and well, it was in a black like leather bound thing. Right. And, and all, all I would cassette, do- Cassette, not reel to reel. No, all, all cassette, right. yeah. He did have a reel to reel from like when he was a child. And, but I don't think I ever messed with that because it was up in the attic and frankly, I didn't, when I was a little kid, I couldn't Easy. figure out how to, yeah. you know, put all the reels of the tape together and all that stuff. Um, plus, it had one tape on it, and it just had baby noises for me and my sister. So I, I wasn't going to erase that, or else I'd be murdered. Um, so I just remember I had my one cassette that came with a cassette player that I had. It was a Philips C60, I think. And so what I would do is I'd plug my guitar into the hi-fi, because I got the guitar, but we didn't have an amp. The amp came later. So I'd, and then you, uh, I'm sure you all know, I'd put it into record. So you plug your guitar in there and put it into record play and go into the mic input and play through it. So that was my guitar amp for a while. Were you recording other friends? Were you working at? No, it was just me on my own at that point. And I, so I would, I, would, uh, I would then put the cassette player, the Philips one, so I'd play through the hi-fi and then record onto the cassette like that. 
Then I got this amp called uh, a FAL. I don't know if anybody in the UK remembers this. It's F-A-L, all capital letters. And it was actually a bass amp. So that was my first amp. It was a bass was amp. Was it a combo or was it a stack? It was a combo. It was about this big, this sort of you know rectangular looking thing. It had volume, bass, and treble. No distortion, no reverb, no nothing. It was a, it was a bass amp. And um, of course, it sounded pretty foul. Right. <laughs> And uh, not, not a particularly great sound. I looked for one the other day on eBay. So I had the, the foul amp, and now that I had a separate amp, what I could do is use the two tape recorders. And that one wasn't me plugging into it anymore. Now I could record. Only the, I only had a microphone that was built into the cassette player. So I couldn't you know, record with that. But what I could do is record guitar into the Philips cassette player, you know, now with a microphone, take that tape out and put it into the Sony, press play and then press record with a second tape. By this time I had two cassette tapes. Playing out a speaker. Yeah, through the speaker while overdubbing. Which so, is what John Lennon did for Double Fantasy with two boom boxes. And so yeah, so I'd play, I'd play a rhythm guitar part or something like that, record it into the Philips, take the cassette out, drop it into the Sony, press, press play, you know, I did a click count in like that and then I'd start playing a lead part through the amp being recorded from the Sony speakers into my cassette player and then I'd put that in and then I'd spend like half an hour playing over and over again trying to figure out harmonies and things because I wanted to be Brian May. You don't have any of those tapes? I might do somewhere. Because now with the... My parent, my mum probably has it. With, with Sizotope, you can get that fixed. When I did you start like going out and working at other studios to make you really get into the production side of things. Well, I, I, started, I played live first, so right. That was kind of, so. When I was sixteen, I left home. I left home at sixteen. My parents moved to Cornwall. Um, we lived in like a little village, connected to a, a, a slightly bigger town, like a little r r rural-ish, not totally rural, rural-ish area. But they, my dad, wanted to retire or at least get out of what he was doing, he was working as a graphic designer, he wanted to just, just be a painter and a sculptor, which he was doing most of his life, but he was getting this extra money from, from you know, working, doing graphics and stuff to try and pay the bills. But he wanted to move to Cornwall, and it was a lot cheaper to live down there so they could take a little bit of the money from the little house that they had, the little bungalow they had, and buy a house almost outright down there, and he could just paint all day. So that was the plan. But when you're 16 years old, and your parents are telling you that they're going to go to the most rural of rural areas when I'm only half an hour away from London and I'm 16 and I want to play in bands. I'm like, I'm not doing that. And I don't know what the rules are now, but in those days you could get, I don't know, emancipation is a big strong word, but I think you could ask for permission to leave home. And if your parents granted it, you could leave at 16. So I did. Yeah. So I left home at 16. They moved to Cornwall. I went to Basingstoke Tech to do study art. Like all good musicians, I studied art. And then of course I dropped out and then moved to the north of England. And, and this is in Cumbria in a town called Carlisle and just fell into playing in club bands. And that was amazing. And you got so into like doing demos with these groups and stuff oh, yeah. like that. Well, then do you we remember what real studio in London you, not real in the sense it had to be an A-list studio, but a real studio that had a real mixer and a real... I don't know machine. if we ever gravitated to it because we had four tracks. So we, we all lived in this big... Um, it was called the King... It was called Kingmore Farm Cottage. I think it got destroyed, unfortunately. It was massive, but it was called the Farm Cottage. I don't know why. But being massive in the north of England is, means very cold. Like, it was absolutely freezing cold in there. So we had fires burning and everything. Um, it was 40 pounds a week. So much cost to rent the whole thing so cheap and we'd play like doing covers and our own material and everything it was a lot of fun um and but we had a four track cassette player um you know for, so we would record demos like that and i remember we had one of the very first or earliest kind of like rx yamaha the right. cheap ones not the, the flash one whatever the baby one was maybe it was an rx 21 or something so we'd have a drum machine which we thought was revolutionary because they were sampled sounds, or at least that's what they sounded like to us. Probably weren't, I don't know. And they were like, wow, we've got a drum machine, you know. So we'd write demos like that. It was it all guitar players or was it a band that you were living with or? It, it, was, it was the band. So it was the whole band. It was, it was the singer, the bass player and me. Um, and we had two or three different drummers. Sometimes we had a drum machine. 
In fact, some places we played like pubs. I think you had to have a drum machine. Some of the little pubs, right. but a, but a drummer and then uh, two different keyboard players. I like to talk about this one keyboard player. His name was Nick Rimmer, who I'm still friends with um, on the wonderful world of Facebook. Um, I like telling this story because I think it's very powerful when we talk about where we're at now with the you know information age or the accessibility that we have. He was. 19, I think, when I was 16. So just, which you know is like Is he like the older brother? Like, yeah, like, yeah. you know, oh my God, you're so old. You're three years older than me, which is, you know. Experience you've had. Yeah, wow. Yeah. But I remember he had um, CP70. So like, which was great, because of course, Phil Collins, CP70, it was the 80s. We're like, woo, you know, why you got CP70? But he also had a Jupiter 8, which was like, wow. The sound. Know? And he was, he could sight read like, Al Jarreau, all of his stuff, sight sing it, sight read it, like put any music in front of him and he'd just be like playing it immediately, even if he'd never heard the song. As long as the chart, as long as the actual music manuscript was written properly with the melody, the vocal melody, the piano melody, he could do it. He could sight sing it and sight play at the same time. And when he would solo, it was impeccable. But I remember at the time just thinking, oh my God, he's amazing. But I remember thinking to myself, yeah, but in like somewhere like LA, there's probably a hundred guys like him. You know what? I've been in LA for 25 years now. I've never met a keyboard player as right. good as he is. But there we are, 19 years old in the north of England in this little, you know, cold, <laughs> freezing cold, wet, damp place, playing clubs and pubs and stuff like that, making a living and dreaming of Los Angeles, dreaming of this great life. There was no internet in the 80s. There was no internet. So you didn't sort of like think to yourself, oh, you know, there was no comparison. Right. You just made this assumption that everybody over there or, you know, London or LA or whatever was just so much more talented. One of my best friends, James, is this guy you're explaining, very film, very similar. Like I was 16, he was 19. Um, virtuoso guitar, he, he's actually lived out here many times in Nashville and stuff. and he is one of those guys that like you can literally say no one you knew it when you were 16 when you met this kid your friend i knew it when i met him and it's the same thing about like yeah there might be people that can play better but they have something very special when i was a kid there was also one of my still one of my best friends um i've been lucky i've stayed friends with 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 kids from when i was super little even living in america for 25 years i'm still friends with them my, one of my best friends patch was the drummer in the sundays i've known him since i was three we're still friends yeah uh matt butcher who is the front of house for gorillas and blur and all this one of the best front of house guys in the world i've known him since i was a little kid and there was another friend of mine john hill hi john if you're watching and he and i started guitar within weeks of each other maybe he was like three weeks ahead of me or a month ahead of me, but basically we started at the same time. And the strongest thing I have is a work ethic. I will still play guitar and probably while writing emails and doing all the other stuff I do, play for three to four hours a day, still to this day. And I still play exercises. And when I'm producing, I always have a guitar in my lap. So I know what the vocal harmony is. I already know the song, how it goes and everything. I just don't stop it. Um, John Which is was, really crucial. It's really crucial. Yeah. Because of, as a guitar player, I don't do that. <laughs> yeah. I probably should. And half the time I have to tinker on the piano to figure out what chords are. By following it, you already know. Yeah, I love it. And, and then when I have to play the guitar or the bass line on any of these demos that you, you, you guys in. and girls see, I'm, I'm already just, I just, we just start recording. Let's fast forward a bit, get into some interesting Studio Universe stuff since this is a book about home recording and such. People want to know some stories. Most people probably know your historical line of when you were doing stuff up until Producer Like a Pro started really taking off and you put a lot of focus into that as well as album making and playing and stuff. But do you remember what was your very first, it could have been label based, but high profile thing that got you into the consistency that became your life for the 15 years, 10 years after that? You know, I, I spoke earlier about how relationships are super important, friendships. And it, they aren't always about the business. A lot of people think that, that you know, you, you have a friend and they can become successful and then you go on their coattails or something like that. That's not been my experience. What's been my experience is having good friends that keep me focused, not by them necessarily going, 
you need to do this. You know, I've had people do that and sometimes it's good. But typically what it is, is I get, I have relationships with people that inspire me and keep me, keep me really on track. And the first proper recording experience I had that really meant something to me was recording Louise Gotham when I was 19. I was 19 years old. I was working in a music store. Actually, I worked in two music stores, one called Kingfisher and one called Anderton's, which I'm sure everybody watching knows. Anderton's obviously has a massive YouTube channel. And that was those were local shops, stores to where I lived. And I was working, I think it was in Kingfisher at the time, and these two sets of brothers had a recording studio, and they called up, and I was the guy selling recording equipment. And they had, they had a band together, so they were going off on the road. Uh, to play some shows. And they go, oh, we just got a booking for the weekend. Would you come in this weekend and record? Um, because I was selling recording equipment. So I was the engineer, you know. That was probably the only engineer that they knew. Come in and record uh, this girl. And we're like, okay. And it's like, it's Louise Goffin. I think she's like, maybe she's Carol King's daughter or something. And I was, was like. Was this her first tour on her first label? No, she was living in London. And she, she was actually being produced by Andy Jackson. Right. Who had produced by that stage, whatever the Pink Floyd album was. Hey, Louise. How's it going? I know you're watching. We love you. <laughs> and so I go into the, I, I go in in the morning and I set up and Andy comes in and the band comes in. It's Girl Land Dorsey playing bass. Wow. Debbie Bowie's band. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, we believe it was the either one or both of the Stacey brothers on it. So if those people know the Stacey brothers, phenomenal. So I can't remember if it was both of them or one of them because we can't figure out who the guitar player was. Um, we're trying to remember. And we can't find the recording, which is even funnier. Um, so anyway, so Andy comes in, the band come in, um, I set up the drums, set up the mics, he brought in two 87s, because he didn't know what we had, put them as overheads, put a D112 on the kick and a 57 on the snare, that was the drum sound. So and we had the sound tracks console, and uh, I believe it was, it was a really weird amount of channels, I think it was like 36, and I can't remember if it was because some of the channels weren't working or whatever, but 36 sticks in my mind. We're talking when I was 19, so it was a couple of years ago. Yeah. So, um, so we come in and record, and it's just, it's kind of inspiring because Louise comes in with these incredible A-list musicians. And Andy Jackson, who I, of course, knew from doing Pink Floyd and was, was the engineer at Dave Gilmore's boat studio. So I knew all about this, so I'm like, yeah. You know. And it's pre-internet, so you can't get all the details, you just get all the hearsay. <gasps> I think my generation would be probably one of the last that had that romantic romance of right. knowing all these people but never meeting them and not being able to see videos of them. Yeah. Yeah. When I met Al Schmidt and Bill and Doug Sachs and all these guys that I knew, rag magazines were out, mechs and all these things were out, but there was just something about hearing those stories, being in the industry yeah. and then meeting them and going home that night and just being like, what did I just experience? I feel like people's opinions weren't so hardened like they are now. Like when I see a comment under a video, people like state things of some kind of hearsay as though it's fact. I mean, I've been told I how- I think it, that's been around. I don't like know if I- don't Media, if, as, it's like, in, I yeah, think I'm it's just the, the outreach media. now everyone has. There was so much more wonder. Maybe it's just us uniquely. I just had that wonder. You know, and so what was great about that experience was, strangely enough, I, 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 Louise and I got on as friends, but we didn't exchange email addresses. That wasn't a thing. Right. We didn't exchange cell phone numbers. That wasn't a thing. We just got on nicely. She thought I was a pleasant lad that was plugging in things and doing his job. And that was pretty much probably our only memory of it. But the whole experience was amazing for me because I got to work with real people that came in and knew how to play and perform and I've been working with local bands, and it was just a massive step up. But it's all about compounding experiences. There's a lot of great books talking about compound effect, and uh, you'll, you'll see why. So I did that, and then the mid-90s rolls around, and I'm in a band, and this band, the girl singer of the band, had done some demos. And I'm learning the songs from the demos, you know, figuring out some baseline ideas from the demos. And she's like, hey, I did this with my friend, Louise Goffin. I'm like, whoa, wait there. I, I worked with her a, Full circle. a couple of years yeah. ago, you know. So I'm all like, you know, and so we reconnect. She's done the demos that helps that band get signed, which is crazy, you know. Those, those, that's yeah. how we get signed to Jeremy LaSalle's, from those demos and other recordings that we had done 
in the same studio. So it's all like all like locked together. And my experience was pretty interesting because we had these recordings that we had done and the, the, when Jeremy signed us, he gave us the opportunity to go and re-record them. So we went and re-recorded them with a, a, a famous engineer slash producer. And then we had it remixed by another famous engineer slash producer mixer. And then we sat in the uh, office and he played the new final mixed re-recorded version of a single. And I vividly remember this because it's so important to uh, my development. He played it and he listened to it and he went, Sounds really good. Sounds really good. And you could see it was like kind of thinking. And he flips out the cassette. This is pre, pre CD obsession. You know, it was all, you know, the CDs were there, but you know. And he puts in the original demo cassette that we had done and he listens to it and he goes, that's better. Let's put that out. And I just remember being like, wow, like a, I, did, I didn't know. I was just did like, you fight that though, considering I've no, been No, 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 he, he was right. I mean, we, we all felt that the, the, the original demo better, had all yeah. of the stuff, but. It was just interesting to have a guy with great ears, you know, it's sign XTC and Porter's head and really knew his schnizzle. It didn't matter if it didn't sound as good. It was yeah. all about the feel. It's and all about the feel, kids. Yeah. In some ways, it did sound better because of all those things you're Everything talking about. Everything worked together, right? So something that's really important I've found is compound effect. So I'm essentially like doing tons and tons of different things. I'm a teenager touring and playing covers and writing originals with my band. And what that allowed me to do was get a good ear and a good understanding of chords and melody and harmony without even realizing it. Because playing other people's great songs night after night. It's pretty busy. This guy is busy. Yeah. <laughs> it's my good friend, Scam Likely. He calls me about 12 times a day. Does he call you as well? I, sometimes, but yeah. it usually comes up as not available, which I go, come on, Scam. Why do you keep changing the name to not available? <laughs> so getting a good ear from playing covers was just huge. I didn't realize it. Of course I didn't. You know, and plus, you know, you're learning the song, so you're developing an ear that way. But also, more importantly, you're playing them every night. There's a great quote from Keith Richards, which I love, which is one gig is worth a thousand rehearsals. And it's true. You turn up, you've got an audience in front of you. You're 16, 17 years old. You're completely terrified, even if you're playing somebody else's cover and you're like this. And that's how I learned to play on stage. That's how I developed an ear. And that's how I learned production because you're figuring out you've got one keyboard player, bass, guitar, and drums, and you're trying to reproduce chart songs. Right. So you're working on arrangements. You're all in a room together. But you're using these covers as your guiding point to learn how to make other people's projects. Exactly. Eventually yeah. learning how the tricks are digesting and dissecting each of these hit songs that you loved as a cover yep. person. And do you think that that played into record Huge. making? Huge, because, you know, especially especially because this is like late, mid, late 80s. And so mid, late 80s, everything was produced. You know what I mean? There was always right. like, there was at least five guitar parts on every song, you know, not every song. So by going into the studio after years of doing this, Absolutely. you already knew. Yeah, inadvertently, you know, so you're sort of, you're taking the three, four, five guitar parts in a song, and you've got to figure out what's the main line, what's the parts I'm going to pick up. Okay, I'll play the solo where the solo is, but what's the main supporting element when the singer's singing and the keyboards are playing, you know? And you're figuring all this stuff out. So it's convincing, and people know that they're hearing the song that they know and love. And that was so much fun. Plus, you know, I've, I've said this many times, I owe Nile Rogers my living, because we did so much like chic and sister sledge stuff even though it was the 80s and it was maybe past disco and that funk era doesn't matter the people we were playing to were a good five or ten years older than me and that's what they wanted to hear right and there's nothing better when you have a club band especially with a girl singer to do like we are family you know or freak out everybody just oh get up and dance and so I just learned to play funk guitar by listening to Nile Rogers. And then, of course, you know, you had the Mick Jagger, Sutter Records, She's the Boss, which he produced and played guitar on, and Jeff Beck was on it. I remember just really, really kind of big period of that mid-'80s, like, as I'm learning guitar, like, being influenced by all these different genres, you know, rock and blues, going back and discovering all the blues and jazz that my father loved. But then, yeah, Nile is huge, huge influence. And it's so wonderful to him still being so important, you know, seeing it. Right. Yeah, it's really, really awesome. I really want to interview you, Niall. <laughs> Maybe we can get a, 
phone call in. Do you remember a book called The Guitar Handbook? It was written Absolutely. by Ralph Denyer. Absolutely. I believe that's one of the best books ever written on music stuff. I was 16 and I bought it. Yeah. And I remember in the front, he put like five or six players. He had Zappa in there. He had, he had like jazz players. He had Hendrix. He had Beck. He had Andy Summers and Brian May. And he just kind of like said blues, jazz, rock. And he broke it all down. And he gave every different perception of how to play and rec you know play a guitar and what guitars are used and what pedals and it was phenomenal and then he just went through so much detail in the book but always made it exciting and i was like i want to write the recording version of that i want you to be excited by it so there's a lot of quotes from the people that inspired me the dave jordans and i got know. three chapters in this on me which is cool no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> going back to the record making you worked on some cool stuff. That first Frey album was not only special because I remember hearing it before they were even signed because my good friend Jeremy grew up with Isaac and the rest of the guys out in Colorado and heard the demos way before they even, right before you guys went to Indiana and recorded, which was a very weird. Yeah, Aaron did the, the demos and I, I think Cable Car, or Over My Head, as, as it was known. Um, the, that's the bass line, and I believe the vocal. Some of that was the original, right? Yeah, I think it, so. Aaron did a great job. He just captured them. So original bass line and original vocal, I believe, were left. But it was strange for a Colorado band to go to Indiana. It was all budget. I mean, what's laughable now is the budget was really, really low for the time. Right. But now it would actually be considered quite a big budget. I think the whole album was about a hundred. But if anybody watching this has any recollection of what it was like in the early 2000s. By the time you hit the second album though, yeah. that was like bloomed budget because they had sure. massive success on the first album. Yeah. You recorded the yeah, second album. Yeah, half the budget on the first album was having Mark Endert mix it. <laughs> that's funny. I mean, that's, that, that was my whole experience of being an uh, engineer and producer coming up, is I would find like a local band, develop them, um, maybe even get them signed and We'd make it for you know five or ten thousand dollars and spend weeks and weeks and weeks making a record, and then the label would remix it, you know, right? And spend seventy thousand dollars with a famous mixer. Right. I don't think Mark was that much. Don't get me wrong, um, but it was definitely on the higher side considering how much we'd spent flying a band out, every accommodation, all that kind of stuff. That was just kind of the way that happened a lot in those days. You know, if you had something really special, there was that security blanket of having a famous or super talented person and not just fame mix your record you know right. it was like a seal of approval um but it was always comical and still to this day i find comical that mixers can work a week on an album and charge like the whole album budget again or sometimes twice as much think about the mastering yeah oh yeah the mastering yeah. it's even better one yeah, it's day even better. one day and it's a third of the mixing budget yeah yeah by the time you got to the second album you had a little more budget you had a little more experience on your belt with the band that you're familiar with you went to Sausalito to record, which was one of the last times. Oh, it's an understatement of the decade, yeah. So it was 28068 stuck together. So Studio B. Yeah, whatever it was called, but yeah, the one with the two 8068s. It was it's the classic room. It was the right. only original room. The other one had been completely rebuilt. Metallica room. Metallica room. Right. Doesn't just sound like a big echo chamber for big drums. Fine, but not original. This was like the room, Songs in the Key of Life. A lot of it was done there. I know a lot of it was also done, obviously, in LA at Crystal, but big chunks of Songs in the Key of Life were done there. So Rumors was done in there. Huey Lewis Sports was done in there. Yeah. And B. Grateful Dead Records were done in there. Bob Marley um, was done in there. Yeah, Just a plethora of... So you think going to this historical era-wise, we're talking about historical dinosaur studios and stuff, and Sausalito Record Plant being probably the two biggest albums in history, that alone should seal the deal, let alone all the Metallica and the fact that Huey Lewis and all these other historical things. Yeah. They would keep up the studio. But apparently on this vintage need that was probably to today... Two of those put together is worth a million dollars. Forgetting about all the other millions of things we can talk about is that you have to go into the center section and do a better job. And uh, I, sub I found out from using it and then subsequently after talking to Tex, um, I could never get like any mixes to translate on it. It was just kind of folded in and sounded small. And everybody said, yeah, the center section. I've just got these two, you know, 32 channels folding into a center section with all of these transformers and everything. And it just got small. It never, ever translated. I could take home a rough mix and put it on 
go back to the hotel, put on headphones and be like, why does this sound so tiny? Yeah. But if that was only if that was the only problem, I'd be okay because at least all the tracks would have been recorded really, really well, and we're only talking about how rough mixes translate. The problem is, I think, well, I can tell you, the first day we get in there to work, set up Ben's drums, start getting tones. And I remember channel one, EQ doesn't work. Pass the signal, but no EQ. I think there's something going on ghost-wise in that building because this is the exact same story Ken went through when they started tracking rumors. And Ken's like, we had to open everything up. We had to turn all the EQs all the way up and they still wouldn't sound right. He said he turned the preamps down and the faders all the way up because that was the only way it wasn't going to collapse. But then he said the second they left that room and went to a different room or whatever, it was fine. But B always had this weird spooky thing. So I'm wondering if there was some other paranoia going on. Yeah, paranoia, paranormal. Paranoia. <laughs> There's definitely some paranoia going on. That's a whole other discussion about the, the energy around there, yeah. The second album, though, <laughs> you guys were at a place where sky was the limit. Sure. And I'm sure you're- It's sold four million albums on, on a record that all in had cost $100,000. So it was recouped like weeks into- At that point, your phone would just ring for people that wanted that sound. And then you started working more and more into different avenues. And then how did you meet Jack Douglas? Well, I co-owned a studio in LA called Swing House. And um, we had um, one room that had an 8058 in it, which was beautiful and completely restored by Michael Stucker. Shout out to Michael Stucker, total genius. Another Midwestern, Indiana boy, great guy, professor at IU. And in the other room, we had a 20-channel API, which was falling apart, but sounded great. It was just, you know, we got it yeah. cheap. I uh, won't say we bought it from because it didn't work and we had to spend a fortune getting it repaired. But it was falling apart, but it still was an API, which is very noisy and buzzy and clicky. Oh, and by the way, I'd, I'd cut drums previously to How to Save a Life, the single, in that room, but I had a tack Scorpion. Yeah, because the single was different than, yeah. than the original, because I remember... They'd done the original with Hot Rods. Yeah. And I hadn't tracked those drums. It'd been done by Paul Mahon, and he had done it in Indiana. Yeah, at Echo Park. Hot Rods. Yeah. Yeah, which is Mellencamp Studio. It was thing. a great room, because they had the Supertramp Breakfast in America console, but they sold it years ago. At the Indiana Studio, where most of the record had been cut, at that point, when I came in and started recutting stuff, was quite nice. I mean, it had the Breakfast in America API console, which Michael Starker had kept in amazing condition. It had Fairchild's. It had a mic collection that was unbelievable. Pair of U48s, everything. It yeah. was incredible. And then we had to recut the drums for How to Save a Life. And this is really early on. The record was already out when we recut those drums. And cable car was like trickling along in the tri-state area around Colorado was just trickling along. And nobody knew what was going to happen, but they knew that this recording just wasn't going to work. Aaron recut the piano in New York, so it was a bit brighter, a bit more aggressive, a bit more like a hit song, and I had to recut the drums. So actually, just to sort of talk about this for a second, is another reason why I, the book makes sense to me to do this, because everything I've always done has always been a little bit punk rock. You know, working with the fray as successful as they were, they were never, ever media darlings. Certainly have never had a review which gave them more than three stars. If they got three out of five, it's a bleeding miracle. Um, they were never hip, you know. And like I said, we cut that drums on a Tac Scorpion with uh, a couple of BAE modules and the microphones were like, I, I didn't have any 87s or 47s. Wait, the Tac Scorpion? Yeah. I didn't know this. Yeah, well, we, I kind of porky pied. That's sweet. Okay. I kind of porcupied. I kind of I pretended that we did it later on with the API, so I'm busted on that. My room mics were Audix microphones with fixed pattern condensers that were about this big, that were like two or three hundred dollars, whatever their cheapest one. Those are the room mics. Yeah. The wide room mics were a pair of 57s. It was a D112, 5757. The only quote unquote expensive microphones I had was I had a pair of 414s as overheads. Woohoo! Which were, you know, like at that point were like $700 when I bought them new. And I, that, I just remember being like, wow, I've got some 414s. But if you listen to the drum sound on the song How to Save a Life, which I'm still proud of to this day. The single. The single. Yeah. yeah. 
So that's why I'm really passionate about when people get into like the gear. I believe in the gear. Look at look around. You know, it's always been a little punk rock in kind of attitude and, and everything. I, I when I ended up, you know, later on working with Jack on like Aerosmith and all that stuff, and working with like I suppose considered mainstream bands. The reason why I got the gig was because I was totally punk rock. So what happened is Jack has. He's always been a non-conformist. I mean, you've met Jack. Jack, you know, he'll come in a pair of cargo shorts on, New Balance trainers. Sorry, I'm busting you, Jack. A cigar, and a cigar might be worth some money, but everything else is just like he's completely unpretentious. He always rents like a rental wreck when he comes to LA, drives like a, you know, $20 a day car, has no ego and gives a crap about he's that stuff. He's one of my favorites. Yeah, he's and, amazing. You know, I, I share a similar thing with Warren where we... We're shadow, protege, whatever you want, the word you want to yeah. call it, the learning of some of these guys that would just share. And then when you're in, it's like you look into it going, man, there's just so much legacy in the, and knowledge and wisdom in everything these guys say, even if it's not even relating or it's something you already know. You also it's, humanize it as well. They yeah. humanize it because you like these people. He's a guitar guy. He always cared about that. And then it's still, honestly, Double Fantasy is one of my favorite all-time albums. We've talked about this 100 times. We talked about it. It's incredible how good it sounds now. It sounded otherworldly at the time, and you, right. I wasn't sure as a kid, because when I started getting into other albums, it sounded so different from everything else that I almost started doubting my sanity. Like, do I love this album, you know, for all the wrong reasons? What's going on with me? And now... All the way modern recording is, you put it up against a modern recording and it sounds like it recorded yesterday. Yeah. So you did some stuff with him right up the top that just bloomed into a huge relationship. Well, he just he just came in because he's this he's he's and this is not a, a, I'm not trying to flatter myself, but he's cut from exactly the same cloth. He doesn't give a crap about any stuff like that. When it comes to like um, like rocks and toys, those records, two of the biggest selling best rock records of all time, were done exactly the same way. You know, putting drums in warehouses and then miking other rooms, putting PAs in another room and then miking that to get the big drum sound. It was always like make it up as you go, renting a house, reeling in a 24 track and then a data mix or whatever a console. Is there a lot of find. stories you learned from him in here? Yeah, there's, I mean, my, you know, so much of it is him and Dave Jordan. Yeah. Um, two great guys, Don Smith as well. You know, I got Nashville tuning from Don Smith. He told me this is how we made every Tom Petty record that he had made. Last Dance with Mary Jane. He goes, everybody thinks this is a Rickenbacker. It's just two Telecasters. He goes, we tried recording a Rickenbacker. It, A, He's wouldn't stay in tune. Right. You know, and then it was difficult to articulate any kind of arpeggiated lines. So he said, then we you know, discovered Nashville tuning, and then suddenly everything can just be perfect and sound like the best 12 string. He's the one that said to me, I know I said it in a video with you and people criticized me for it, but he said, I, I, so I said, so you didn't use Rickenbacker? He goes, no, they look great in videos though. He's the one that said that, it's a great line. Because they do, they're beautiful looking guitars, you know. It's movie magic, it's our rock and roll version of it. You know, um, it's a bit like, you know, the great thing, like I said, the, the, these things, what made it, so good for me was like meeting Shelley Ackers and Joe, Jay Messina and, and Jack Douglas. Man, all these records that I grew up listening to that I believe were some of the finest sounding American records. Phil Ramone, yeah. you know, I only met him briefly before he died, but these guys, Al Schmidt, you know, getting to hang out with these guys at Cherney, you know, I'll keep going, you know, all the same guys that we know. Um, they humanize it for you and make it into a work process that you had to do experimentation and take away the mystical. It might still be magic what they did. It's magical because of the performances and stuff, but they make you feel like you can obtain it. But I think what's important, because I've talked about this before, is like I'll get some negative comments and they're all like, oh, you're so lucky to have it. Like, I, I've been making music for 20 years before I met Jack Douglas. Right. And the reason why he worked with me is because I had made these records that he liked the sound of, and I had done it in a completely you know, maverick to be American way. Just however we could do it. In the book, I talk about like, if you want value for money, like you can buy 24, $3,000 mic prees if you want, or you can just go out and buy like a used DDA. When I started watching you in around 2016, it became really apparent that what you were doing was just constantly trying to give. And then there was other right. people that obviously in the YouTube world, 
you kind of get lost sometimes. Your way gets um, manipulated or influenced by comments or how many views you get, and so you start doing that. I've never read the specs on anything I've ever bought. Have you? Yeah. You have? On yeah. what? Specs like- Oh yeah, like but you're talking about like interfaces and things like that. Well, I have to, because I don't understand how anything works unless I read the back. Right, back but when, when you're buying a microphone, you, but, but all the microphones you no. bought were based on the records they were made, on the right. sounds they create. That's how you buy a microphone. You go right. into a studio and you see, oh my God, an RE20. Oh my God, that guy put it on a kick drum. Oh my God, that sounds great. I should get an RE20. Yeah. You don't go, no, I, I have to ignore how it sounds. I need to look at the specs. Before, you know, you just, oh, you just... I know a couple of those guys if you're watching. <laughs> you know who you are. But you know what I mean? It's like, that's not how we make a decision. I, I agree, yes. If you're gonna buy an interface, especially if it's like a, a, a two channel for your mix to go through, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that it can handle and not distort and blah, blah, blah. I get it, there's certain things. But when it comes to things like microphones and stuff like that, I wanna know how it sounds. I don't care if it says 20 to 20K and it looks flat on their thing. I was blessed by falling in love with music when I was so young. Right. Because you know, most of us, get into music at like 13, 14, 15, in puberty is like, I want to be a rock star and stuff. I was already obsessed with music at seven years old, thanks to my dad. The one thing I've noticed is there's a lot of stories that have been mentioned in here. I can see some photos and stuff of some previous videos you've done with like you and Bob Clearmountain and stuff. Why did you choose to do a hard version when you already have the digital YouTube version, essentially? Well, I think honestly with the book, you can go into much more detail. And it, there's a permanence to it as well, where I think uh, what I love about watching videos is there's a conversational element like we have here and you fill in the gaps and everything. I love print. I love books. I read all the time. And when I'm not reading, I do audio. So I'll do audible. So in the car, I just listen to audio books. And when I'm at home, I read. I'm just, I'm a reader. Yeah. So it's always been that way. I love I love what reading books does for me. You know, it really is inspiring. And like you were saying earlier, it's a reference manual as well as being a book. You can read it in one sitting if you've got a hundred hours to read. But, but it's everything we're talking about. It's about pre-production. It's about how to work with artists. It's about the right studio equipment to buy. When you were asking me earlier about was there any one thing? No, it was compound effect. Compound effect of like doing crappy demos on a four track. ADATs, I was uh, soundtracks. Why didn't you call this home studio recording the compound effect? Because in theory, you go through this book yep. and just talking to you today about the process and your story in general, yep. everything is not, it feels like everything comes through from the last thing that happened in your life and then it yep. accumulates to- Well, that's, that's the other book I'm writing. <laughs> that's the other book I'm writing. Well, yeah. thank you again, and if you guys haven't, keep an eye open for Home Studio Recording, The Complete Guide, that will be out, when is this coming out? Early January. Okay, so Probably it'll be out when top you're of watching the year. This. When you're watching year. this, it will be out. It will be out. So again, 